Hey, greetings, everybody, and welcome to the ABT Time podcast, which we think this is our 18th episode. And if it's the ABT Time podcast, it must be three o'clock in the afternoon in California, which means that in Melbourne, Australia, where our wonderful co host, Dr. Jen Martin, is located, it is 8 a.m. How are you doing there, Jen? Good morning, Randy. Oh, look, I am so well because in Australia, it's National Science Week this week. And so that just means I've spent a whole week doing fun activities with cool people getting excited about science. So what, what better could happen? Well, this, this episode is going to have a lot of science to it. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to talk about <laughs> science of surfing, uh, I think. Um, so I gather, bring it on. <laughs> bring it on. Uh, let's see, we've got three little topics to run through here before we bring in our wonderful guests. And Topic number one, what about that episode last week with Bruce Block? I, I've been thinking about it so much, Randy. I learned a lot and I've been thinking about how I want to learn more about visual stuff because, you know, that's not my world. My world is talking and words and writing. It was awesome. Thanks you know for what? introducing me to him. I should try and force feed it to one of our guests, Brian Bielman, today because um, – what, our guest last week was Bruce Block, who's legendary visual expression instructor at USC Cinema School, has been teaching the course in visual expression for since 1977. And his book, The Visual Story, right here, um, is an iconic book for all filmmakers in Hollywood. And he talks about the seven elements of visual expression, which are line, shape, form, tone, color, movement, and rhythm. And one you of the remembered. Baffling, oh, yeah, got him down. Well, you, you did, too. But one of the baffling things was this idea that that a still image has rhythm that and he began by telling us about a, a line on the screen has rhythm and breaking that all down. That was mind bending. That that was a great way to open that whole thing. And then he got into and then I loved how it all ended with Jason Enzor telling about uh, when he shot that show, what it was a uh, Fra uh, Frankie and Grace. Um, he had Jane Fonda. And they had a break in the action there for an hour and he sat and talked to her and he told her about um, the movie Clute from the 1970s and the visual structure of Clute. And she said to him eventually, she, he said she was riveted and she finally said, 47 years since we made that movie, no one has ever told me this stuff was going on in the movie, but it's all the visual <laughs> elements that they were using to build the tension, the whole thing. And that's what Bruce does in his course is breaking down that. So, so many of those examples that he ran through were fascinating. Um, so I encourage all of our listeners, find the time and listen to that because it was such a good discussion. Also, we had my two director buddies, uh, Jason Enzler and Greg Tillman joined us for that. Uh, second little tidbit I wanted to mention was my buddy, Dr. Michael Osterholm, director of the University of Minnesota's Center for Disease Research and Policy. And he's constantly in the news. He was on Meet the Press this week in NBC on Sunday morning. He and I had a long talk on Saturday getting ready for that. And I, I spent a lot of time trying to work with him in terms of the things that he'll present. Uh, he did a great job with, he had two kind of metaphors. One was the idea of seat belts, And this has been going around is whether or not it's even worth wearing cloth masks over your face. Um, he came up with a great little analogy, which was he said, um, you know, remember the old seat belts that you had in the 1960s that were just a lap belt? Um, those weren't the best thing. And if you had a choice between one of those and a modern seat belt that has a shoulder harness and everything else of course you'd want that but if you don't have the option of the modern harness go ahead and use the lap belt you know at least it does something yeah. and that's the deal with those cloth masks you know they're not perfect but at least they do something so he's mm -hmm. done a good job of communicating this stuff unfortunately our government has done a disastrously bad job and this week they're in the thick of it again this thing about the third shot versus a booster and they're using two different terms and so yesterday, my older brother contacted me and said, you know, his wife's got an immune uh, disease and wants to know, uh, should she get the booster or the third shot? What's the difference? And I wrote to Oster home. He said, there's no difference. Same what, thing, no, surely. Same thing. <laughs> why, why are they using two terms and not, uh, you know, send your narrative. Why don't they get on the same page? It's, it's an unmitigated disaster. They all need the ABT framework is the bottom line, but I'm not about to go up there and try and force it on them. Um, third thing then is relating to our course, the ABT framework course. And yesterday we had uh, pa Patty Limerick was the guest. Were you able to tune in or you, you got busy with other stuff? You weren't able to make it, right? No, I couldn't get there, unfortunately. Yeah. And no, no worries. Um, you've seen her before and she's wonderful. And she tells her thing about the fool. And it's such a great little video in particular that we recorded with her for the narrative blitz. And we now show it as part of her presentation. And what she talks about is there are two types of fools in the world. There's the 
everyday annoying fool that nobody wants around. But then there's the official fool, which is the person who just makes it clear they don't know your field, but they're interested and they've got good common sense. And the questions that that sort of quote fool asks quite often can be the most important questions. And that connects directly with our central guest for today, my buddy, Brian Bielman, um, who's world famous surf photographer. And Brian, I met in 2006 in, uh, in Fiji when we shared a, a bungalow with a few other dudes uh, on a surf trip there. They brought him in as the surf photographer. And he and I bonded instantly. We became like brothers. He Two years ago, he came and lived here in my house uh, on and off during that year for quite a bit. Uh, he's one of the funniest guys I've ever known. He's a tremendous storyteller. That's the true bond that I have with him. Uh, I've met tons and tons of surfers, and he just stands way out as a guy who can tell great stories. And that's why I've tried to drag him in on some of the things that I've done. But one of my favorite things has been twice in Hawaii, we have done my workshops. So we did one about oh, seven or eight years ago at the Hawaii Convention Center in Honolulu. And it was at the Ocean Sciences meeting. And I did this workshop with about 25 of these PhD students or postdocs and, you know, really doing hardcore research. And I invited Brian to join us because at the core of my training is narrative structure and storyteller. And so storytelling. So I kind of brought him in as exhibit A. Here's your basic person from off the streets that can tell you a good story. Um, then we did another one just two years ago. One of the last things I did before the pandemic in January of last year, we did our Story Circles demo day in Hawaii in Pearl Harbor. Um, Noah has this incredible building there that's an old, uh, two old hangars there at Pearl Harbor that they've converted and made into their offices with several other big government agencies. And we did the demo day there with about 40 people in the room. And I brought Brian to that one as well. And on that note, I'm going to ask Brian to join us first before our other two guests because I want Brian to give the introduction that both of those workshops that he provided for everybody. I'm sure he can remember. Brian, are you there coming to us from the North Shore of Hawaii? I am. Can you see me? We see you. How are you Hi, doing? Hi, everybody. Okay, so Brian, what is it that you told the group as part of your introduction there Mention Center that first time? <laughs> well, First of all, both times I went, uh, I realized, I, I thought about the whole gigantic building and all these scientists and all these different people. And I told Randy, God, Randy, I've just realized that I am for sure the dumbest guy in this whole building. <laughs> and, I, was I, and you're like, yes, you're right, but you're a great <laughs> storyteller. <laughs> That's exactly Can the truth. Can you trend. imagine being in a building with, with this many people and realizing for sure I am the dumbest guy in here right now? And, and, you know, the tragedy of our society right now is you're the number one guy they need at the Centers for Disease Control. They need you sitting there in the lobby all day where they send their communications people up to you and have them try and explain their stuff to you. And if you could understand it, then it's ready to go out to the American public. But I guarantee you, you know, you'd be sitting there like, what, what the hell? Booster shot, third shot. Why are oh. you telling me two things here? No, the only thing that makes me feel better is when I realize that most of the planet is in the same boat as me and doesn't know what the heck's going on. And that's, we don't know what we don't know who to believe, who not to believe. Am I going to take that? As a matter of fact, this is the most fun thing I'm doing today because I leave right after this to go get my second shot, my second vaccination shot. I didn't. I held off for so long, and I'm I'm going to get my second one, which means probably the rest of the day I'll be feeling like crap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you know, well, this, my day. this is your last hurrah. Very first night I ever met Brian. We were in Fiji, and. He showed up like at midnight and all of us had been there for a day or two and they threw him into our, we had four people in this little cabana and then an open couch and there he was sitting on the couch. And so he and I sat out in the front porch and he had a bottle of Captain Morgan rum that we started drinking and talking. And next thing you knew it was sunrise and I'd heard five or six hours of, of Bielman stories, which are crazy. Um, you know, Brian, why don't you tell us about your early career as a professional surfer that ended abruptly near Pipeline? Uh, how'd that go? <laughs> well, first of all, I would love to sit here and tell you that I had a career as a professional surfer. As but aspiring, I'm aspiring. Not <laughs> professional. I was a neighborhood nobody. Uh, <laughs> I loved surfing and was smart enough to move to the North Shore and just was taking on oddball jobs here and there just to keep surfing. And then when I was about 20, I realized that I had to do something for a living. And that's when I started kind of go through panic mode, you know, sort of worrying about what in the heck am I going to do? 
And I just decided one day I was going to be a surf photographer because I would get to keep surfing. That was the whole reason. And I bought all the equipment and I couldn't stop surfing. I just kept going out in the water going, I'm going to go surf for a little bit. Then I'll come in and then, and then I'll shoot. And you can't do that. I mean, there's no way once you're on the water surfing, you're not going to come back in. So I was having a really hard time getting started. And then I had a surfing accident where I pulled up into a barrel. That's, you know what a barrel is. Uh, yep. Pulled up inside of it. The whole thing kind of collapsed on me. And I was going over the falls with the wave, the lip throwing back down to the reef. And I, I was waiting for all the impact on my feet, but I was upside down and I didn't know it. And I slammed so hard hitting that reef. And I remember just seeing stars and I came up and started kind of putting my hand around my head and my finger just slid right into this big hole in my head. Uh. So I ended up going to the hospital and the doc back then it was pretty archaic times here, uh, you know, with hospitals and stuff and the doctor sewed it up, but didn't take all the coral out of my head. <laughs> so I got made Which explains everything today. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe that needs to be part of your introduction, Brian. I'm the dumbest man in the room because I got a head full of coral. <laughs> Truly. Um, anyway, it uh, yeah, so it, it got majorly infected. And after about a week, I, it's funny, I was showing uh, slides one night. We used to do that all the time because there wasn't a lot of entertainment. And we're showing slides. And I remember opening up, uh, I mean, turning off the slideshow and turning on the lights. And there was a girl there and she just looked at me and screamed. And I looked around the room like, what the heck? And the next thing you know, my brother's like, call the hospital, tell them we're on our way, this and this. And I'm like, what? And he goes, go look in the mirror. And I looked in the mirror. My whole head had blown up like a balloon because the infection had gone to the back of my head first where you couldn't see it. And by that night, it had gone around and I had like a Frankenstein forehead. <laughs> so I remember going into the hospital. Plus, I had smoked a joint, so I was stoned. So I'm like looking at myself with this Frankenstein head, like so in shock. And I went to the hospital and she just said, we don't know if it's gone into your brain. If it's gone into your brain, there's nothing we can do. And I was just, and, and I remember I just said, just knock me out. She, well, we can't knock you out for some reason. So they ended up cutting the stitches while I laid there with no anesth anesthesia or anything. And it was the most painful thing I ever remember going through. And by the end of it, I was so drained of energy. I've never felt that. Well, I have felt that when I've gotten stuck underwater for wave after wave after wave, but it was, it was crazy. And they finally knocked me out. And when I woke up in the morning, my whole head had blown up like a balloon. The infection was so bad. However, made it through all that. And a week later I was looking good, but I was still out of the water. Couldn't go surfing for a month because it had a heel from the inside out. And uh, I just ended up grabbing all the camera equipment and I finally started using it. And so it's kind of funny how things like that work out. If I hadn't gotten in that accident, I would have stayed in neighborhood nobody for the rest of my life and never become a surf photographer. And, and that's it. And uh, so now I'm a surf photographer and I still get to surf, but not as much as I wish I did. So, Brian, talking about you being a surf photographer, I have spent quite a few hours in the last year or so sitting here chatting with our good friend Randy with that amazing picture behind him. Yes. And just, I mean, yeah, I've, I've looked it up so I can actually see it properly because there's always a bit of reflection on Randy's image. So I have actually, you know, now seen the image really beautifully myself. I know it's one of the most famous um, surfing photos of all time. I can't not ask you to tell me the story. Like, fill me in. What's the story behind that incredible image? Well, the story about actually, well, you saw the story about shooting it about how I barely got out into the water. When I finally got out there, all of a sudden the first set came and I was like, oh my God, that was my story leading up to it. Um, it was one of those things where, you know, the swell was just building all day long. Um, Nathan is one of those guys that honestly, that just kind of stumbles into these incredible situations. You know, he, he was there on, um, holiday with his wife because he had tell, tell, us who, tell us who nathan is oh nathan's the surfer in the photograph yeah. and he, nathan fletcher yeah yes he'd been in this you know to he uh fiji excuse me the swell before that as the movie stated and got a beautiful giant big bluebird day wave and um he was set he was fine he had the best wave of his life he just went to Tahiti just to have fun with his wife. And then he heard about this swell and just decided to show up, go down there, see what was happening, see if he'd catch a wave, if he wouldn't catch a wave. And he just stumbled into everything. Then there was a guy, oh, hey, come on, I'll give you a ride out. Swam in the channel. Another guy came up, hey, jump on the ski. I'll pull you into one. 
And it turned out that he was out there at the peak of the swell. He just happened to be on a ski catching a wave right at the biggest part of the swell when it was the biggest waves. And that wave just, you know, you have to understand when you're catching waves out there in Tahiti, it's not like this huge swell coming in that you know this is going to be the biggest one. It comes in and there's no back to the wave. And what happens is the bottom of the ocean sucks out. So he, you know, anybody on those waves basically doesn't know which ones are going to be the big ones and which ones aren't for the most part. You can kind of tell, but you never know for sure. And that's how that one all, all worked out. He was being towed into it. He got to the bottom and it just turned into this, you know, wave that have never should have never been ridden by a human. And he, there he was, he found himself on it, you know, and, and once you're on it, you're, you're going, there's no holding back on that. And uh, you know, it's funny because that day there was, 30% makeable waves, 70% not makeable waves. And his was one that I would consider a not makeable wave. And he just took off so far back and we saw that whole thing start to build and him disappear inside of it. And then the spray coming out, just blasting him out of it. I mean, there's so much force coming from that amount of water being spit from the energy within the tube. Blew all outside of him. And at the end, he, I just love the way he, you know, being a, a skater and a motorcycle rider, he just loves getting air and he, it just blasted him out. It was like the last act of defiance, you know, coming out <laughs> of that thing. And then right after he does this air in the peak moment of the craziest part of the wave with all the most energy exploding behind him and he does this air and then just the whole thing collapses on him. And it's like, if he would, if he would have died right then, it would have been the most coolest thing ever to happen. <laughs> I, well, not for him. <laughs> but I mean, the fact that he like just beyond everything, he went for it, you know, and just defied everything for that wave, and uh, and luckily did make it out. Of course, I'm you know just thinking as if it were a movie about that wave, it would have been cool that he died. But cool did he, he did he know how good that wave was when he was done with no, it? No, he said that he never because you know you're looking at getting out of the situation you're in. You're looking ahead. He had no idea that wave was as big as it was. And I sent one of the photos to his dad and his dad sent it to him. And I think that's the first he realized how big it was. But that photo ended up, uh, not that photo, the wave ended up on about eight different magazine covers. Like nothing like that has ever happened. And it's funny because there was surf photographers sending their photos to all different magazines. And I couldn't because I was working for one magazine. And I was a little bit concerned they, you know, they just run a big wave cover. Where are they going to run it on the cover? But there was something deep down inside of me. I knew this was the best version and it would withstand whatever time period we were dealing with. And it really has. It has sort of become the, the shot of that, you know, famous wave. There's a lot of other beautiful shots, but I think that one's kind of won out being the greatest one, mostly because my positioning with the boat I was in, who was, you know, the super crazy Tahitian boat driver and um he just kept us way on the inside which is why we had that angle with that you know 80 feet of white water exploding behind the wave everybody else was looking in the barrel and that was a really cool angle but just seeing that white water behind the wave personally i think that's what made it so incredible you, you know and what, brian did you know so i was going to say brian did you know instantaneously that you had the photo of a lifetime or was it later I looked, reflecting I back? I looked at the back of my camera and on those cameras, they're so small, you know, the picture. And he's so tiny in the picture too. And I kept zooming up to see if he was sharp or not. But of course, when you see that on the back of the camera, you can't tell. So I literally went home just praying. And there was a lot of good waves that day. But I literally, I literally got on my hands and knees by my bed. And I was like, please, God, make this one be sharp, please. And I scrolled through super fast all the photos until I got to that one. And it was razor sharp. And I, I knew at that moment that was the greatest photo I'd ever taken. Pro maybe, probably the best photo I would ever take as far as a surf photo. So now let's bring on our other guests. And at this point, I will excuse myself as a host. I am now a guest from here on out. And Jen, you're going to take it from here and explain to our audience what in the world this episode is about. So Julie and Brent, Join us, and I'm done with all the moderating until the very end. So go for it. Good morning, good afternoon, Brent and Julie. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Great. 
Yeah, I'm I'm super excited because, you know, well, firstly, Randy's never handed over the reins to me before. So I'm feeling really power hungry and I feel like I should just go totally crazy here, but I won't actually do that. But actually, I'm just really excited because I've just watched your movie, White Rhino. And this is where I have to be completely clear that although I am an Australian and I do love the beach and I started playing in the water when I was, you know, three months old or something, I'm not a surfer. I've never been a surfer. I don't know anything about surfing. I I went the kind of scuba diving route instead to embrace my love of the ocean. Um, But just having watched your movie, you've just blown my mind because you've just completely immersed me in a world of professional surfing and big wave surfing that I knew absolutely nothing about. So I'm pretty excited that Randy's handing over to me and I get to ask you guys questions. But Julie, I want to start with you because I'm pretty sure once Randy gets started, he'll never shut up. I don't know Brian um, and Brent yet, but but maybe if they're good mates of Randy's, that'll be the case for them. So I, can I start with you, Julie? Just tell me, how how did you actually get involved with this project, making uh, a feature-length movie about uh, big wave surfing? Crazy. Um, well, it was, we were at, uh, what was the contest here? It's, um, we were at the Haliva Pro, and oh, that's yeah. where we met Brian. And we met Brian, uh, just casually on the beach there. And, um, it was just really, but we were in talks of just, he was looking for, to do some. Yeah, this is, Brian tells the story way better. Yeah, we should. So we just, <laughs> yeah. he, he tells the story of how we met, oh, so. yeah, yeah. Maybe we should wait for that. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, I'll let I'll let Brian tell that story. But then I want to come back and hear your story too, Julie. Like what, you know, what did you make of this whole process? Because as a woman, you know, it comes across as a pretty blokey world, this this world of all these men being out there surfing. And, and you know, I, I didn't see very many women in the footage that I saw. So I do want to come back to you, Julie. But Brian, do you want to tell the story? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Of, and of how you all met? Up, we were all down shooting the contest and Brent just happened to come and kind of sit close to me with his video camera. And then Julie came and sat down with him. And my first thought, of course, was, oh, my God, his, his girlfriend's super hot. So, <laughs> then, of course, so then, of course, I decided I wanted to talk to them for a little bit longer. And um, Brent, you're super hot, too. But I'm, you know, I'm, I just go one way. Um, but we started talking a little bit about the surfing industry and what Brent did. And, you know, he's a... a video guy shooting weddings and but he's a surfer and he loves surfing he said he really wanted to get involved in something in the surfing industry and I said well you know I've got these small little projects I want to do these sort of story behind the photos kind of thing would you be interested in doing that and he was and that was sort of the beginning of you know our relationship right then and I have said said more than once in public that how hot his girlfriend is so she's (laughs) okay with that she's sort of and I I think Brent's okay with it too by this point (laughs) and again Brent you're super hot too yeah, I know she's hot. <laughs> and so, so I don't know. So I don't know anything about surfing movies. The closest I've ever got to a surfing movie is Point Break. So tell me, you know, is this unusual to investigate the world of surfing via the photographers? Is that something that's ever been done before? I don't know. I've seen a lot of surf films. I don't know. Brian, you might know better than I would on that question. Well, I think, I think what we did was really different. You know, we took something that some people argued in the beginning was like, we've seen that already. It's already been done. You know, those are three famous Mm. swells. They were plastered all over the map, but Brent had a vision and he did it totally different, you know? And I think that's what makes the movie so cool. You know, we've got three of the most incredible swells from a, like a one year period And we just show all the people involved, the surfers, the photographers, you know, and everybody that follow these kind of things. And basically it's all about our life during those three swells. And so that was a really unique way of kind of going over the same subject matter, you know, but because they were such incredible, you know, swells, historical swells, everybody wanted to see all that footage again. So Julie, going back to you then, so these are historic swells all happening in the space of 10 months, I think it said in the film, you know, this incredible time to capture this story and then not just to capture the story of the waves and the surfers, but to go into the minds and the experiences of the photographers who were there. I want to hear about your role. I want to hear what you were doing and what you were experiencing and how you saw the story. Well, we started because we started just shooting uh, basically interviews with all the surfers and it was really just for Brian's like little project because we didn't have a film in mind at the time. So he was calling Mm -hmm. over his 
basically as surfer buddies. Um, and we uh, shot in his studio there. And it was like after uh, about what, three or four interviews, um, it was really Brent that just was like, there's just so much more here. There's such a big story. And he just was shocked at all this stuff that was coming out of these guys and in the interviews and everything. And I just remember the day, like, he was just like, I got to do a film. Like we got to do a film, right? This, this can't just be these little, you know, videos, uh, you know, he's like, I got, yeah. I got to do that. I got to make something big out of this. So um, basically, yeah, we were just like, all right. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, I, I think Brian's original plan was to like do the behind the photos, but just like a mm -hmm. three to four minute video on each one and put them up on YouTube or Instagram. And after we started doing some of the interviews with the guys, I mean, the story started kind of come coming together from different perspectives. And then, uh, you know, and all these photos that he wanted to do just so happened to be within these three swells. And then, yeah, after all the interviews, it was just to the point that it was like, you know, there's a bigger story to tell here. Um, and I didn't want just to go to waste on YouTube. So uh, yeah. I basically took the footage over like a year and a half and I just pieced it together. And then I came back and I showed Brian for the first time and I think that's when Randy got involved I think that's when Randy came in and kind of helped us structure it out a little bit better for the story and yeah it slowly came together that way one of the things that really struck me is the language of surfing okay so my day job is teaching scientists how to communicate in ways that other people can understand them so basically how to not sound like scientists and one of the things that really struck me about this movie was it's there's so many different layers to it because on the one hand you can just sit back and be completely immersed in the craziness and the power and the beauty of these waves and you know some of the language that came out of the movie about um, you know getting hooked on them and I don't know there was so much beautiful language people just really sharing their deep emotions about being out in this powerful surf but then there was all these all these words that I'd never heard before that I kind of needed a translator you know I, I wrote some of them down let me have a look so you're talking about you know a bluebird and then dropping in and then it, what's a heavy wave and eating it and I'm like Jesus I don't know what any of this stuff means and I and I sort of thought does that matter does that matter that you haven't translated it for the fool for the person who isn't a surfer or do I just kind of stand back and observe this culture and this community that I'm not part of? So did you think at all about the language in the movie? Um, a little bit, you know, like the thing is my angle was I've seen hundreds of surf films and a lot of the surf films I've watched are just surfing to music. And for me, that gets kind of boring after a while. And I kind of wanted to hear like the story behind it. And yeah, for like, you know, guys to use certain words like bluebird or stoked or drop in, that's just part of the culture. So, you know, I yeah. feel like it'd be a little bit harder to kind of, you know, explain each definition. But at the same time, I just kind of like, you know, the way it flows, if you watch it a few times, I think you kind of get the understanding of what they're talking about that they use the language that they would use with other surfers made me feel welcome. It made me feel like I'd been invited into this world that I'd never even knew existed. So I love the language, but I just thought it was so cool that there are all these words. I'm like, oh, I'm learning stuff. <laughs> it's kind of like those few little things you don't understand are almost more mysterious. It's like making love to a French yeah, yeah. woman who don't know what she's saying. And it kind of almost makes it better, you know. <laughs> Gee, Brian, I've never had that experience. Hard to, hard to relate to that analogy. <laughs> Tell us the story, Brian. Uncle Brian. <laughs> oh, but no, you you actually hit on specifically something that did come up because we hit a stage there. You know, once um, Brent went off and put the movie together for a year, came back, showed it to Brian, and then Brian called me up that night and said, "You know, this is a really good movie." And I said, "I'll be the judge of that." And then they got it to me a couple of days later, and I called him back, and said, "You know what? This is a really good movie." Um, and then we set to work with me just kind of offering up suggestions on fine tuning. And that very thing came up, which was especially the member Brent Bluebird. And I, I was pushing him. I said, you know, what, what's a chance you could maybe put some text on the screen defining what Bluebird means, something like that. And he pushed back on some of those things. And that was me, the scientist. And then there you are, the scientist also getting hung up on that. We're a little more literal minded, whereas the broader audience a little bit roll, rolls with that. Like they don't really need to know what, you know, you get the general idea of what Bluebird means. And I think that's how he pushed back. But there was one moment that I, I've told a lot of people about I thought was really awesome, which was I was giving him some notes and I said, look, you know, if you change this and this and this, then you'll have a story that can do this and this and this. And he said back to me, I, I don't want that. You know, the only thing I want is just a film that kicks ass. 
And mm-hmm. that was his whole editing philosophy was just, I just want to make a film that kicks ass. And that's what he got in the end is a film that kicks ass. And we had so many screenings where you could just feel it kicking the ass of the audience. Um, that one we had at the Newport Film Festival, it was the opening film. And that one in particular, you know, it was a packed theater, probably about 300 people. And it got to the final 15 minutes and the theater just went silent as everybody was watching and riveted attention. Not a single person whispering to anybody next to them, just drawn in. I mean, Brent, you must have had a bunch of screenings like that. And over 50 festivals it screened at, is that right? Yeah, yeah. It, it, it played all over the world. It was pretty crazy. I think Brian was out in Portugal or something and he got recognized from White Rhino. I think he was at Nazare, <laughs> you were telling us. But yeah, it played everywhere. It, uh, it was really cool to see you know, all the film festivals it entered. I think the one that sticks out the most was that first one in Hawaii at Turtle Bay and just the audience like full house, you know, standing room only drunk. And it was just, it was more than I ever could imagine how the turnout would be. And then just see here in the audience and how everyone took to it was incredible. Yeah, it was cool. You know, can I say, yeah, first of, of all, I was going to say, it's funny that you're asking those questions because to me, the movie really kind of talked more to the general public. I Like most surf movies are way more just for surfers. Whereas this one really did kind of play more to the general, not just to the general public, but so that the general public could understand it, you know? So that was one of the things I did like about it. So if you went to see a regular surf movie, you'd really be scratching your head trying to figure out what the heck they were talking about. Man, that, that is true. You know what else happens in your average surf video nowadays or movie is all this footage of the dudes in their cars driving down the roads, getting to the surf spot, taking their boards, off, just all this stuff that just doesn't say anything. And every single minute of White Rhino is saying something. There's there's just none of that stock footage of the guys driving their cars down the road. No, dude, we're going to surf. Blah, blah, blah. Um, it just that's part of why I think the whole thing is packed with so much. I mean, that's a tribute to Brent as a filmmaker that he knew how to make the film constantly be saying things in every moment, all these little stories and things like that. I mean, don't you think, Brent, you watch so many of those films and they're just they're all, I, I just get so, I fast forward through all that stuff. All right. We know that you wax the boards and we know you, and you know, you travel bags and we know what it looks like to walk through an airport. So many of them have the guys at the airport and yeah. Well, the yeah. really different thing about it was that it included the photographers and the cinematographers and their points of view. That was the real big difference. And it's funny too, because I wasn't quite ready for how much time I was on screen in the beginning. I was a little embarrassed. And, and I remember thinking like, God, you know, I don't, was that a little too much? But everybody was, you know, it was really interesting. But I do remember being at the first showing and I remember Mark Healy and Dave Wassel and like 10 minutes or whatever it is in the beginning where it's just all about me. And I remember them starting to look at each other like, I thought this movie was about us. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I remember that. <laughs> and I and I and then, but by the end of the course, come on, they were the heroes. Are you kidding? And so I think then they were okay with it. But the first part of it, I I could totally see their faces looking at each other like, this is a fucking movie about Beelman here, you know? And the other <laughs> thing I was gonna say too is that the surfers really surprised us. I have to say, I've known those guys for all my life and they're funny guys and everything else, but they were very articulate in getting their points across so that most people could understand this, these situations they were in. And, and so, you know, it, that's also what made the movie so interesting too, where it was that there was so much um, of interview stuff in there. And that really made the movie especially different than most, like Randy's talking about, here we are on the plane, here we are wax on our boards, you know, that kind of thing. Tell us a little bit about the, the wedding videos, you know, and kind of <laughs> sh- shatter the myth there because your average American, when they hear that you made wedding videos, thinks that you were sitting there on the side of the, you know, the church with the camera running or something. But uh, you've shown me a couple of them. And that's they, where he learned to story tell. Yeah. T- tell us about that, Brent. That, that's exactly it. Um, you know, in, in the last 12 years I've been doing weddings, we've done over 650 weddings and a lot of weddings are very much the same. They're cookie cutters. I mean, the, the exact same thing happens. You hear the same speeches. So just by doing so many weddings, I just kind of like learned how to like find what's unique in that wedding and kind of focus on that story and try to, you know, find different angles of like how I can tell a story from this that's that can be different from the last one I did. Um, so I think a lot of that was that like, you know, just learning instinct, I guess, from just doing so many weddings. 
But then I guess when it came to the surf, it's, you know, I'm just an outside fan. Like I, I just love the surf industry. I love the surf, like watching surfing. And th that was the thing. Like I went to Brian's talk story about a year before I met him. And I was really interested in Brian Bielman's work and I would see it all over, you know, surf magazines and everything. So I went to his talk story, you know, and I was kind of, you know, interested about what it's like to be the photographer on these adventures. Wait, wait, like, what do you mean by his, his talk story? Tell us more about that. So Brian did a talk story at Turtle Bay. Um, it was, I think it, they called it talk story at the, the same place where we showed the premiere, the surfer bar. Um, and he just told us about, you know, he basically kind of talked about some of his famous photos. So I already had a little bit of insight behind that. Yeah, I actually drove in from town to go see it. Big fan, Brian, big fan. <laughs> And then uh, a year later, I met him on the beach and I know that he had stories. So, it, it, and for me, I'm kind of an outsider in the sense, like I didn't grow up in the surf industry or the surf world. I kind of fell into it later in life, but I'm obsessed with it. I love it, you know, but I also want to know like, what's it like for Brian Bielman to get there? You know, you don't hear these stories. You always hear about the surfers and, you know, their adventures, but what's it like for the guys who are, you know, doing a profession like photography or cinematography, what's their trip? Like what's their trials and tribulations? And I feel like every, yeah. So in a sense, every swell does have a story, um, whether it's getting there, what happens in the water, coming back, you know, what, what comes from the swells. I think every, every big swell can have a story for sure. Um, I, I don't know about, you know, a four to five foot ground swell. I mean, <laughs> I don't know if I have a good story with that. I don't know. Um, give, give us a few words of your background. You grew up in Canada. Both of you are from Toronto. Is that right? Yeah, we grew up. We actually went to high school together. Um, and we're about an hour south of Toronto. I grew up snowboarding. I was a huge, huge snowboarder. I chased, I traveled the world just trying to snowboard. Lived in uh, Park City and Mammoth, California for a few years. Then I got hurt and I kind of fell into surfing. I was living in San Francisco and I just wanted to learn. I mean, I was, I surfing looked amazing. I used to have a poster of Kelly in a barrel and I was like, I could never do that, but I want to do that. I want to learn how to do that. So I kind of put that as my goal. And then. Okay. You know, okay wait, wait, wait a second. Wait a second. We, we're hoping that some of the listeners are not surfers for this podcast. So give yeah. us a few words on what Kelly in a barrel means. It sounds like. Oh, a sorry. Yeah. Kelly, like a, Kelly a year or something. <laughs> I think we lost Brian, but 11 time world champion, Kelly Slater, um, in a, in a big wave where it breaks is it's called a barrel. Um, I used to have a poster on my wall and I, I actually was like, you know, at the time I just, I didn't understand it. I didn't understand how a human could get inside a wave like that. And then I just kind of made it a goal that I wanted to get barreled. So I moved to Hawaii and I spent five years just trying to get barreled and I, I had some <laughs> it sounds really painful getting barreled that that's uh, awesome I, I think we found the title for this episode kelly in a barrel yeah that's right <laughs> can i just ask brent brent does the snowboarding world have the same you know incredible culture and you know how what, what are the similarities and differences between the world you came from as a canadian with not that much surf nearby and then moving south and suddenly being immersed in this surf world what are the what are the similarities what are the differences there's a lot of a lot of similarities, like the, the language, the talk. Bluebird is a big one in snowboarding when it's, you know, cloudless day, just blue skies. Um, you know, so the culture is very similar, um, but it's a little bit more relaxed in the surf world. And I, and I understand why when you're in tropical areas and just on the beach all day um, in the water, it's different. But, um, you know, out of the water, it's nice. So, yeah, OK. And so, Brent, obviously, um, you know, I've read a whole lot of reviews for the movie. Everyone, pretty much everyone absolutely loves the movie. You've obviously got a massive following. But Randy did alert me to the fact that there was one crazy review, which I just have to ask you about. There was one review which claimed that some of the videos had been photoshopped because it looks like apparently that the surfer is stationary and the image has been pasted into a moving wave. How do you feel about crap like that? You know, obviously your movie's been super well received by lots of different audiences. I've heard about all of the, you know, amazing um, uh, presentations that you've had. And, you know, how do you feel? Do you just kind of go, oh, look, whatever. You obviously have no idea what you're talking about. Or does it actually great? No, um, you know, I, I, they don't 
clearly have the understanding of how we put this film together. Um, you know, it was very shoelace budget. We had no money. So we were just working with what we had. And a lot of the photos were given to us by Brian and Jolie. Um, so, you know, it's just trying to use that photo however many times I can with while making it look interesting. But Brian was working with a company and I don't remember their name, but they were the ones who were like doing those like motion, like when you saw the wave moving, but the guy was stationed um yeah so they were giving us that stuff to use and that's what I think they're seeing um mm -hmm. but it, it doesn't bother me it's, it's just the reality of it is we only had so much stuff to work with and I had to kind of put it in where I saw it fit so yeah okay wait a second Jen you you left off the other comments that, that was a review from a moron it was a one-star review from some idiot that tried to suggest no it, it was you, a three-star review actually well okay it was still the lowest one on the whole <laughs> website but it was some knucklehead who didn't understand art and uh now those shots yeah, are yeah. very very cool and then suddenly they here's are, this, this guy yeah trying to suggest it oh you're faking surf photos as if you need to fake anything when you got these gargantuan what what was the height of those final waves the white rhino what what do you figure the height was roughly no, I think Joe Lee mentioned it was like 80 feet, 70, 80 foot yeah. pitching out though. So it's not like, you know, not like what you see in Nazare where it's just like this crumbling wave. These things were like barreling, like they were throwing water like 60 feet over, you know, so it, 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 it's it, phenomenal. It, yeah. Yeah. Now, now those final shots, did you Photoshop all of those? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. Yeah. Um, I, I had a buddy who, um, is a really good surfer and he posted this awesome photo of him carving up in a wave and then i on facebook and i put on there oh photoshopped he got really mad at me um, <laughs> <laughs> finally got himself one good photo and then i went and said that brent haven't you had tons of people come up at screenings and said they love the movie because of the storytelling and then they say it's the, a lot of them said it's the best surf movie they've ever seen and isn't that usually at the core of what they say i i think to some extent what's at the core of, of what their general comments are is oh my god the waves are so big but at a deeper level, I think it's that the, the stories are so tight and, and packed together there. You got thoughts on that and your experiences at screenings, Brent? Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's about right. You know, we got a lot of really good feedback. Um, I, I just like to chop it up, like, just because I'm there and they're just being nice, but. <laughs> I, <laughs> I've, I've never, I've never nice. heard anybody say anything bad about that movie. I've never heard. And I, and believe me, I'm around a bunch of, surfers that love to drag you down and stamp on you and make you feel bad everybody <laughs> everybody loves that movie I'm, i kid you not i felt like what really kind of stood out to us is um the surfers showing up for the screenings i think like yeah. bruce yes bruce showed up to like three or, or four of them three i can't four, remember yeah. yeah and like i think that showed a lot to yeah. for us like yeah. that he was okay all right here let's let's do a little exercise brian if i made a wager with you and asked you to bet money on the odds of bruce iron showing up to four screenings of a movie he's in <laughs> how much would you have bet that that would not have happened why why is it so unlikely that bruce wouldn't be at a screening Oh give, my give God! Us, give us a little background on why why that's well, shocking. Well, Bruce is—he's like the last great, you know. He's like Sid Vicious or or Johnny Rotten or something. You know what I mean? It's like you cannot count on that guy for anything. And he, <laughs> every step of the way, he was with us on this. And for for that matter, all the surfers all showed up. It was it was I couldn't believe it. And I, I don't know. I honestly think. You know, part of it, I think, is because I'm very good friends with most of those guys. But still, believe me, that still doesn't even guarantee anything. But they did. They all showed up and they all gave us so much of their time. And that was what was so awesome about it. And every one of them has been so stoked that they did give their time to be part of it. Because like I said, everybody loves the movie, especially those guys, you know. And it, so, and it super comes across that they absolutely want to be there. They want to be part of the storytelling. They revere the experiences that they've had and they want to try and share it. I think that comes across really clearly. But yeah. Brent, I have to ask, um, have you got another surfing movie that you want to make or do you feel like White Rhino, like that's, you know, that's the epitome. <laughs> You've told the stories. You, you're moving on to other things. Like I just love to hear whether there's more surfing movies. Yeah, that Brent, you are we going to do any more movies? need to be told. There's definitely a, an itch I need to scratch when it comes to making a surf film. Um, just because this one, like I said, this was kind of, it was just shoestring. We 
didn't have any money. We just kind of, and I think that's why the surfers themselves were so like, you know, just natural when we were doing the interviews. Cause we were in Brian's studio. We didn't have any lights set up. We had a window. Um, you know, we were, it was just so <laughs> low key. So I don't know if those guys thought it would be anything and they were just kind of like really cool about it, but they were like as candid as you could be like, you know, some of the emotions in the stories, it was just like, yeah, I've heard yeah. like it's, it's kind of like a round table talk story sort of thing. And that's kind of cool because they're at least themselves. They're, they're, they didn't think it was going to be something and put up like this persona. It was just really, really raw the way and the way Brian could get them to talk. I mean, I don't think I would have been able to do that by myself. So I'm pretty sure a lot had to do with, you know, the, our setup. Well, here, here's one little thing. Let's talk about this for a couple of minutes because it relates to what the podcast is about, um, which is that you went away for a year and came back with a movie that was really great. So it's not like I played a big role in shaping the overall movie. But that said, the way our collaboration began was March of, I think, maybe 2018 or something like that. I was over there for a week surfing with Brian. And then Brian said, hey, there's this young guy that wants to maybe make a movie with me. And I'm not sure he knows what he's doing. Would you mind talking to him? <laughs> <laughs> and one morning, Brent and Julie <laughs> came over. Like that, and anyway. no, that, that's pretty much, I mean, it, it, you know, with the best of intentions. Um, and I, I, I think Brian really wanted me to kind of gauge whether this guy was serious or not. And then um, I sat there and I gave you an hour long ABT lecture, which, you know, I'm sure you hadn't heard the ABT before. And you took all these detailed notes and I was very impressed. You know, like, wow, this guy's really listening. And I gave you the little refrigerator magnet at the end and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then you went away for a year and then we talked after I'd seen the movie and was impressed with it. And I remember you saying to me, um, there were so many evenings when you and Julie would play back a sequence and look at it and say, oh my goodness, this has fallen into that and, and, and thing that Randy had warned us about. Um, isn't that, am I right in recalling you're saying something to that effect? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't know like the structure of what I was doing. I mean, and then you kind of verbalized, you know, what it is that needs to be the actual structure of storytelling and definitely helped me when I was, you know, and I, and I did keep that in mind the whole time I was, you know, editing. So, you know, it's, you know, ABT is the end, but therefore, and you know, the setup, and then you have the problem and then you have the solution, right? So and, and then you have another problem and then you have another, so you can, you can keep <laughs> yeah, yeah. going for months. It's like that thing, like, you know, that stuck the most is when you're talking about the guys from South Park and how they always say, if you can replace it with a butt or a there, is it a butt or therefore? Yeah. Then it's better than to replace it with an ant. So I kind of kept that in mind in the back of my head. And it definitely, definitely helps when I'm, you know, trying to tell stories. Yeah. You know, I, I think part of how the process works and for myself, included is either you got decent instinct to begin with or not and then you you tell the story without thinking about the abt and then once you've got it out there then you go back and you start looking at it, and that's where the abt thing helps you move it a little bit further to the next level and i think that's sort of what went on with you and i working together after you put it together for a year you already had it the basic stories all fleshed out there and then that's where the abt stuff really helps you sharpen them up and get them even stronger and make it clear that you're stating the problem and clear what they're doing all that sort of stuff I say that because I've got a screenplay right now that we're in the thick of that's that's doing well. And the reviews just came back on it. And the overall statement from the reviewer, this is a, a paid reviewer, you know, completely disinterested third party. He said, um, the bones are in all the right places and the foundation is firm mm -hmm. for this story. And that's it, you know, that it now it needs to be fine tuned and everything like that. But that's the key thing is that you've got that ability to lay it out, clear stories. And then it helps a lot when you got people like Brian who has such deep intuition when he tells a story, it already comes out really well shaped. It's not like, I mean, you know, trust me, you, you probably know I've interviewed so many people and there's the vast majority of people are in that and, and, and thing. And then this happened and then this happened. They just don't really have any sense for what they're telling. Um, so yeah. Randy, when, when we first started this <clears throat> podcast, you said, did I watch the movie? Did I do my homework? You were checking up if I'd done my job. And I said, yeah, I actually watched it twice. <laughs> the reason I watched it twice was because the first time 
you know, you and I've discussed lots of times that if an ABT structure is used well, it's invisible. It's seamless. You don't, you're not even aware that it's there. And so the first time I watched it, I was just immersed in the storytelling and just loving being invited into this, this genuine world of, of these people who live such different lives to me. But then I got to the end and thought, oh, crap, I didn't even notice. You know, I didn't even think about the structure because I just loved the story. And that's why I went back to check that the ABT was there. And that's when you know the ABT works, right, because it's completely invisible to yeah. to an engaged audience member and secondarily you go back and kind of analyze it and think yeah yeah it is there there's no and 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 that bored me the problem and the solution dynamic is always there so that's that's exactly what we talk about well you know to to that very point and and this is getting a little technical but one of the things we did do was work with brian a little bit to structure the overall journey of the film and try and fine tune that bit at the beginning where Brian talked about that photo that he saw, where was it, Nihas or something like that early yeah. on and use that as a point of structure. That wasn't there originally. So then we picked on that, tried to make that yeah, the that jumping anchor. off point. Yeah, that he was mm -hmm. looking for, you know, that ultimate photo as he went along in his journey. Those structural things are important. And, you know, Brian, you and I had a long talk yesterday about the series White Lotus that just con uh, concluded on HBO and he and I both watched this. And then I went and tracked down a bunch of articles, interviews with um, Mike White, the writer, director of it. And interestingly, uh, and this isn't giving anything away to anybody, but the, the opening scene of the whole six part series is there at the airport at the end of the journey. And there's a coffin basically that is being taken off the plane. And it means there's a dead body. And so the whole six part series begins by showing you a dead body. And then you spend the whole time occasionally thinking, did you find that, Brian, as you were going along, you were kind of wondering, you know, who was in that that coffin? Yeah, yeah. But I have to say, the ending of that, I, I just, the more... I well, let's, let's, let, wait, don't get into the ending, because yeah, we don't I want to spoil everybody's listening. But, yeah, but, right, but the right. reason I picked that up is because up the whole yeah, movie. In, in this interview with Mike White, he he's a very artistic director, and he usually does really artsy things. And he said, this is the first time ever I put a dead body into my movie to try and improve the, you know, hold the viewer. And that's exactly, it. Uh, you know, it's it's a little bit contrived, but it pulled you in like, well, who is in that coffin there? And you do spend the whole time wondering, you know, wh where are we going to get to finding out what's happening here? That's the structure stuff of storytelling is that you do got to plant those things early on to hold the viewer in there, to take them on a journey. And that's what we worked on. A little bit with that and i think that's one of those things when people come and tell you how much they really like the movie that's an element they can't quite pinpoint it but they could feel they were moving forward on a journey in the whole thing that that relates to our podcast here in story structure yeah one thing i wanted to say was i have this friend he's got like five houses he lives in balboa island you know it's like i look at this guy and i'm like damn he really knew where the cash register was you know it's like I myself have just never quite figured that out. And, and of course I look up to that's success. And he finally watched the movie, him and his wife, after I kept telling him so many times and he called me up and he goes, Oh my God. He goes, I am so depressed. I feel like I've done nothing with my life. He goes, the life you've led, the life all those people have led. It's like you, you didn't, you just filled every, I feel like you filled every moment of your life with something exciting. And I just feel like I've done nothing. And of course I assured him you have millions of dollars and I don't, but, <laughs> but it did make me realize it did make me think about like, that's what Brent showed everyone. It's like, that is the truth. We are all millionaires in what in yeah. our lives. We, I mean, we don't care about the money side of it. It's like, we've done exactly what we want to do with our lives. OK, let me let me get in a little piece of perspective on exactly that now that I'm thinking about this. So I met Brian in 2006 in Fiji and a tremendous storyteller and then started going over there every year to surf the North Shore in the spring with him and his place. And as I kept visiting there, I, I kept saying, you know, God, there's got to be some way to, to make use of your your storytelling and you as a, as a persona, exactly what you're saying there, what your buddy said to you. And then in 2000 and I think November of 2010 or 11, I went over there to visit him with my buddy Joe and Brian wouldn't answer our calls for like three days. And I finally kind of got fed up with him and then finally calls it up, calls it up and says, oh, my God, you got to come over here. We got to drink some rum uh, because for three weeks he'd been completely consumed with the death of Andy Irons. And Andy Irons was the number two surfer in the world and beloved and had died um, unexpectedly. And the whole world was mourning and Brian had put together a slideshow that went around the world like overnight and viral on YouTube and a million views. And so he had been inundated for three weeks. And 
we came and spent a couple of days with you then at that point, and you were just wrung out from the whole experience. And I had you sit down and I recorded you telling all the stories of all the photos that were in that slideshow, because every single photo had an incredible story behind it. All those pictures of Andy Irons, the pictures of him proposing to his bride there on the beach uh, that you were hiding in the bushes taking pictures of them of the proposal and the photo there of who was it that's sitting between um kelly and andy uh, the first time that yeah yeah yeah, exactly the first time the number one and number two surfers in the world met and everybody andy was the bad boy and everybody thought it was going to be a fist fight or something and there they were and you know they were buddies um all these amazing stories in those photos and then i tried to get some producers in hollywood interested in the treatment that I put together from all that stuff. I said, look, this would be an amazing version of the Andy Iron story told through the eyes of this world famous surf photographer who was the closest to him of all the photographers had more photos than anybody. And I tried and tried and tried, you know, and it's so hard without major resources to get traction going and something like that. But it left me with this burning desire. I wish somebody would take the Beelman perspective and do a good job of putting it on film and that's when, you know, when I watched that first cut of White Rhino, what Brent had done is exactly that. He captured the true Brian Beelman up there on the screen, those early shots of him, his record collection, all the funny, quirky little <laughs> moments, the whole damn thing. What does he say? He's, he had this 5,000 LPs in his in his office, lining the walls, and he points to it and says, it's 3,500. 3,500, and he turns the camera and says, well, I guess my kids aren't going to get to go to college because I spent all the money on my records. Pure (laughs) Beelman, and that is the depth and joy of this movie, is that when I looked at that, like, God, thank God that Brent had the sensibility to know how to capture Brian the right way, because there's, you know, there's a bunch of other little films that Brian's in occasionally. He sends them to me. I go, ah, this guy didn't know who you are. And Brent really did. So that, I don't know how you knew how to do that, Brent, but you really just did. You got the three dimensions of this guy, assuming there are three dimensions to him. I, I think there are, <laughs> maybe there's four. <laughs> we totally forgot that you had already done that first video, our first initial one, the story behind the photo of Andy Irons that was, init- that was eventually used as the poster for the Pipeline Masters. And that was about a three to four minute video. And it was incredible and do you remember when we showed it at the Pipeline Gallery and Ty Van Dyke told me later that he had to go outside because he was sobbing in tears. Yeah, that's so. how like, that's how heart wrenching that it was just, so you do, you have a, a knack and yeah, I'm a great storyteller. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. But the, it's when you took all that footage I had nothing to do with it after that. I mean, basically I helped get the footage of the action. We did the interviews. We, I provided you with the photos. And from that point on, it was all in, I didn't see you for a year. I'd almost forgotten about it. And so somehow you took, I don't even know how you did it, all that footage and made this story that was your vision and killed it, you know? so. Yeah, yes, you are the storyteller when it comes to putting movies together. For sure. And then to add on to that, you know, my role was really marginal. I just came along after the fact, after he put the whole thing together and helped to fine tune stuff. And I would say about half of the notes that I gave him, he took and the other half he didn't. And most of the ones that he didn't, the good thing was he always came back and said, I'm not going to do that for this reason. Um, and that was that line I said earlier on where he, I said, look, if you do all this thing stuff, you'll have this. And he said, yeah, but that's not what I want. What I want is a film that kicks ass in the beginning and i did get you to come and visit with him because we all were on the island at the same time and i and i yeah i can't remember if you'd already done the other video yet or not but i really wanted you to meet him because of the abt and i think that really stuck with him and by the time the movie came out you saw it you were like god he really listened to me and then you just went back and helped the two of you guys switching some things up you know fine points to just really make it just flow. Well, and, that, and that's, that's a very good point because eventually um, I should do some workshops with some of these surf filmmakers um, because that is the bane of surf films is, is the absence of storytelling. You know, they have a tendency to just wallow in, as we're saying, you know, everything to do with surfing is awesome. Actually, only if you're a hardcore surfer is everything to do with surfing. Awesome. If you're not that, then you really kind of need to have this more efficient brain that's picking and choosing the things that, that can reach a bigger audience and which is exactly what we end up with there. Um, we're just about out of time here, but this is awesome. We, we dug in deep here and got into some of the Beelman stories and that's, what's amazing. Um, 
You know what? Let, let's just do one last story. Let's see if you can make this happen, Brian, because this is one of your stories that I love hearing again. But, yeah, all right. All right. It's performance time. This is the, the, the trained monkey. I'm going to take the stick and poke him a little bit. Come on, come on. Dance for us. Dance for us. Tell us a story here. But make tell us, us this. Tell us the story about the day, the gigantic day at Waimea when you got taken out on the back of that guy's jet ski and <laughs> you were out there in the monster waves. And the <laughs> Okay, I'll do the five-minute version. I won't go any longer. Perfect, perfect. Go for it. Okay, lean a little closer to your microphone. Okay, so it started out, you know, it was it was the Eddie I. Cal contest, 2000, what was that, 2016 maybe? And I was hired by Quicksilver to shoot this thing. And I was going to go out on a ski and you're stoked. You got to ski and you can stay out of trouble for the most part. You sit on the shoulder of the wave. Anything a little big comes in, you kind of, you know, spurt off. Yeah. In other words, there's a wave breaking and then there's a channel that you can safely sit on the ski and photograph for the most part. Things happen, but that's the basic idea. This particular eddy, it, it, it was so big Usually on a, on a big swell like that, you may or may not have one wave that closes out the whole bay, which means it, one wave doesn't break in the one spot. It's so big that it, it breaks all at once and it comes across the whole channel. And basically it's what's called uh, closing out the channel. This particular day of a, the eddy contest, it, the sun hadn't even come up yet and there was already about eight to 10 closeout sets. It was gigantic. I honestly didn't even think they would be able to go. It was so big. And they decided to go. And I remember just thinking to myself, oh, my God, I've got to go out there on a ski. And I saw the guy that hired me from Quicksilver. And he was like, he's like, Brian, if you don't want to go out, you don't have to go out. Don't do it. And I remember thinking to myself, oh, my God, I can stay on the beach and shoot. And I'm going to make the same amount of money. And then for some reason, something inside of me just said, if you don't go out right now, you're going to regret it for the rest of your life. And so I grabbed all my stuff almost on autopilot, ran down where the ski was taken off, jumped on the back of the ski and got a ride out. And even just the ride out, we had to go from side to side, trying to find part of the wave that wasn't already breaking to get over. And this was like 10 waves we had to go, you know, and took us maybe five minutes to what typically takes about 30 seconds. So we finally got out there and I just remember looking at all the other photographers and it wasn't one of those situations like, wow, we're so stoked. We're out here shooting. It's so good. We all were looking at each other, jet ski drivers, photographers, everybody. We we're all looking at each other just with these big eyes. Like this is, this is the real deal. This is crazy. And it's funny. I don't mean to, uh, um, what's the word where I'm trying to make it more you know, exciting than it really is. Um, embellish, embellish. I'm not trying to embellish the story, but honestly, it was one of those things where you had to finally get to the point where you just realized if something happens and I don't make it, I'm doing what I love to do. Cause it was that crazy, you know? But anyway, I remember sitting on the ski and what it is is there, there's like five skis and there's a guy on the beach and he's the walkie talkie talking to all the skis at once. And I had gotten on this ski and the, on the back of the ski, there's a strap that's tight onto the seat. And that's what you hold on to so that when you start going over bumps and stuff. Well, I noticed right away that the, the strap was super loose, almost like the reins of a horse. And I'm telling the guy, like, dude, the, the straps. And he's like, yeah, straps broke. And I'm just like, oh, my God. And all of a sudden, next thing you, know, you can hear the announcer going, there's a giant set coming. Get out of there. Get out of there quick. Start heading out. It's closing out the channel. It's the biggest one of the day. Go, go, go. And I'm just on the back of the ski. I mean, you, there's nothing I can do. I'm just there, you know, going for the ride. And I remember he went over the first wave. We barely got over the top and I could see another wave. And it was, it's, it was like looking at a three-story building. And we just raced and raced as fast as we could. And we got over the top of that one. And when I got to the other side of that one, it was the biggest wave. It, it looked like a 10 story building all the way across the whole channel. And, all, and he, I remember him just saying, hold on. And I remember we raced alongside of it. We went all the way like to the top of the wave or two thirds up the wave, racing down the side of the wave, trying to find a place where the wave wasn't already starting to crumble so we could make our escape and get over the top. And we got all the way to the other side of the bay and there was no way we we're going to get around it. So he had to turn the ski and literally it was a 40 foot wave. And we started from the top of that wave, riding the wave all the way to the bottom of the wave and then outrunning the thing 
the whole time I could have lifted my hand behind beside me like this and touched the wave that was breaking that close to the, to the ski. And I remember I had my legs clenched so tight to that jet ski and I was holding onto my camera and holding onto this friggin' horse rein, just jumping and bouncing and the things going like this. And, and I remember at one point the guy turns around and he says to me, you may have to jump. And I'm just like, okay, just tell me when, you know? And, and actually the photograph that I had that someone got of us, you can see him leaning over his shoulder and it's the exact moment he's telling me this. And I remember we got so close to the inside of the shore, almost to the beach, and he turned the ski around and the shore break was gigantic. And he busted through the first shore break wave. The whole ski gets airborne. I go flying off the back of the ski, but, but because the strap is so long, I managed to hold on to it. And I managed to pull myself back onto the back of the boogie board onto the ski just in time for him to bust through the second wave, the same thing same thing lose the you know fall off the ski hold onto the strap pull myself back up and then luckily we jammed it made over the third wave and then for the next five minutes we had to go back and forth like this trying to find a spot on the wave we could get over we finally made it back out into the middle of the ocean and i just remember screaming both of us were just screaming that we sur had survived that and i just told him dude that is the craziest thing i've ever done in my life and he looks at me and he goes, that was the craziest thing I've ever done in my life. And I'm like, dude, you're a stunt man. You're a, you're a, uh, uh, what do you, a lifeguard, water, waterman. And I was just like, I don't want to hear that was the craziest thing you've ever done. And it was, and it was nuts. And we, there was for the rest of the day, the time that I was out there, there was probably about five more waves that came through or sets that came through like that. I was in a better position for most of them to be safe, but that one was crazy. And then and then all of a sudden, next thing you know, they're telling me, I, right when I'm acclimated, like, okay, if I'm going to live, I'm going to live. But now I'm excited to be out there. And half the day's gone by, and they make me come into the beach. So because another photographer was going to come out and shoot who didn't want to come out, he was inside fighting with them. He didn't want to come out. And I kept saying, I will give you guys my photos, but they made me come in. And I remember I got to the beach, and the whole beach is like stuck behind one of those little ribbons. And they all start applauding and I'm like screaming and I'm like looking around, like thinking another set came in and they're all, they're all like screaming and applauding me for being out in the water. And this couple people came up and the one guy's some South American guy, dude, you are so heavy. Can I get a photo of me and you? And I just looked at him. I said, dude, I'm not heavy. I was just hanging around with a whole bunch of guys that are heavy, but I'm not heavy. <laughs> and I walked over to the showers and the next thing you know, another closeout set came and three of the skis all came running in, and that's the famous one that was all over the TVs. But they had seen the wave so far in advance, they were way in front of it. We actually rode this thing. Oh, I got so <laughs> 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 like excited. Um, and, then, uh, and I just remember being so happy. That was our punchline. <laughs> Who was that? I was so happy that I was not in the water anymore who was that telling you to shut up well, that's my ex-wife okay <laughs> do you have to talk so loud <laughs> oh my god all right that was the grand finale that was the climax everything built to the the giant wave story um all right thank you very very much brian you are the all-time great storyteller and i mean the one thing that's clear from this little discussion is we got to go make another movie we got to figure out how we're gonna do that because Brent knows how to capture the chemistry. Brian knows how to tell the stories and I know how to fine tune the stuff to bring them all together. So we will work together again sometime soon. Jen, you got a fa final comment for us on this whole discussion? Oh, look, I just want to be the fangirl who says, thanks for inviting me into this amazing world. I just, yeah, loved it and loved listening to you all. And tell me when the next movie is. Absolutely. And everybody, you know, you can watch it on Amazon Prime. It's on there. And yeah, it, it's really a fun film. It, it definitely delivers. So uh, thanks guys for taking the time to join us here. And I'm sure that when this pandemic thing goes away, we're going to all get together on the North shore sometime again. I soon. So. And we're going to go hang out at Tur Turtle Bay and admire all of uh, Brian's photos that now hang on the walls of all the hotel rooms there at Hur Turtle Bay resort. Right. You know, uh, as funny as I thought about that today and I'm like, I can't even afford to stay in the room that's got all my photos in it. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have uh, to that's awesome. The maids, the maids cleaning up just to take a peek at my photos on the walls. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. All right, everybody, take care. Uh, Julie, Brent, thanks for joining us. Brian, I'll be talking thanks to you again soon. Time. And Jen, I will see you next week once again on the ABT Time podcast. Look forward Bye, to it. Great to meet you all. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.